Thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Michael Atkinson. I'm the Vice President of Wealth Management at GNF Financial Group. GNF is committed to empowering our members and providing advice to make smart financial decisions. So to this end, we're very pleased to welcome Deputy Chief Economist at Central One, Brian Yu, to talk about the global and economic outlook. Uh, Brian will speak for about 40 minutes and then we will open it up for questions at the end. Uh, on your webinar, you can uh, uh, ask questions just by typing it in at the bottom of your control panel. So I'll pass it over to you, Brian. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Michael, and uh, thanks to GNF for organizing uh, this webinar. Uh, so like uh, as Michael mentioned, I'll be speaking just for about 40 minutes or so on, uh, on the current economic environment where we expect to see interest rates and also look at uh, some of the more localized economic drivers for the province and the housing market as well. Um, so if we just start, uh, if we start to take a look at what's happening on the on the interest rate in Canadian front, uh, it, it's good to look at what's happening on a global economy because uh, fundamentally that drives um, the overall rate conditions and, and the global interest rate uh, profile. And, and what we're showing here, what we're seeing here right now is uh, the global economy really continues to show improvements. Uh, what we look at uh, often is uh, the purchasing managers indices. Uh, it's an index which tracks output, new orders, uh, new exports, and a number of other uh, key drivers for manufacturing. And what we're seeing right now is that globally, uh, the index that we track is about is at a six and a half year high, and it really does point to a rising global production. Uh, we're we're firmly in expansion mode right now. Uh, and which is being uh, led by developed economies. Uh, here in this chart, what you're seeing is uh, the PMI numbers for um, various developed and, and the other major economies. And what we're seeing here is that Europe has generally turned a corner. A couple of years back, we were talking about what a basket case Europe was, very high levels of unemployment, uh, essentially a ongoing recession that, uh, with, uh, with a very uh, troubled banking system. Uh, more recently, however, Europe seems to be the uh, one of the, the current growth leaders, uh, and with the PMI numbers, they're at um, uh, they're the highest among uh, the markets we're showing here. Uh, really being uh, driven by consumer, there's a lot of consumer demand occurring as a result of low uh, oil prices that have helped the consumer economy. We're also seeing uh, the impacts of uh, growth in China. Um, last year, I think around this time, where there was a lot of concern about uh, where China was going. Uh, in terms of their in their growth profile, but um, you know their policies right now are more geared towards having growth in the six and a half percent range, which seems to be providing a lift uh, globally for other uh, other trading nations that are reliant on uh, China. And it's a virtuous cycle. Uh, as Europe does better, they're driving more demand for Chinese product. Chinese product, uh, as they're moving more toward consumer economy, they're also providing this virtuous cycle for other types of exporting markets. Um, when we look at the U.S., again, all these PMI numbers are generally positive, uh, and uh, China also uh, has, uh, is doing a little better. Uh, when we look at the International Monetary Fund, what we're seeing is uh, they've upgraded their forecast for the economy to about 3.7%. And while this is still below mid-2000 levels, uh, due in large part to the maturation of, uh, of the Chinese economy, what we're seeing is that there's a lot of synchronous growth right now. Um, all of their, essentially all of the, uh, the economies or global uh, uh, countries uh, that they're surveying and they're looking at are in growth mode. Uh, a few years back, we would have looked at probably only about 85% or so were growing or expected to grow. So it's, it's, a, it's a positive picture for the, uh, the global economy at the current time. Uh, when we look at this though, um, <clears throat> economic growth is rising, but we have to consider that uh, central banks are still, main, are, are still really helping to propel this growth through very low interest rates. Uh, we're seeing inflationary pressures that globally um, they've improved. Last year they were sub 1%. We're expecting about, I believe, 1.3% this year in inflation globally. Um, and that's still quite low. Most central banks do have, advanced central banks have a target of about 2%. Um, and in order to maintain the growth that we're seeing, uh, central banks are still maintaining very low uh, interest rates. You have the ECB at a zero range. Uh, Japan is uh, negative, uh, uh, negative interest rates uh, and negative real interest rates, um, and and of course, uh, if we're looking at other factors or other um, types of tools, they're also still engaging in uh, things like quantitative easing and, and other alternative uh, monetary policy measures. 
Uh, as we go forward, as the economy continues to, to rise, we will see uh, some of this normalization path occurring over the next, probably next year, first starting with a uh, rollback of quantitative easing. We're already uh, seeing some of that in the U.S., but uh, the, uh, you would expect Europe and some of these other countries to also uh, move away from some of those alternative uh, measures. Uh, before moving into the uh, actual rate hikes. Um, going 2018, I, I don't expect to see the ECB uh, raise their, um, uh, really do much in, in terms of raising their tar their policy interest rate. Uh, but again, some of that moving off of the uh, alternative measures is, is likely. Um, in the U.S., uh, it looks like we are still in pretty good shape. The most recent Q3 uh, advanced numbers are showing about a 3% growth in the economy. A lot of it's being driven by um, the consumer sector, but also some uh, some broader gains, some improvements in residential, some um, uh, some of the business investment. Um, the hurricanes that affected the southern states uh, that had a temporary negative impact for growth. But um, you know, as we move forward here, that rebuilding efforts from the uh, um, uh, rebuilding efforts in these in these states, uh, Texas as well as uh, Florida, that should also provide a, a stronger gain for the economy going forward. And we've already seen a rebound in such uh, in some of the uh, indicators, such as motor vehicle sales and, uh, and demand. Uh, and retail spending also has been bouncing back. And that unemployment rate, so in, in terms of where the U.S. is going, we still expect to see growth somewhere in about the 2.3% range going forward um, in uh, 2018. Uh, they are still being driven by uh, a pretty strong employment growth picture, uh, as well as very low unemployment rates. Unemployment rates are around four, uh, around four percent, four and a, four to four and a half percent in terms of their uh, their trend. Um, the inflationary pressure still remain pretty low, though. Um, CPI inflation is weak. Uh, wage growth is is uh, is showing some firmness, but it's it's still not uh, very strong. And We'd expect that this means that any, any rate hike cycle from where they are now is going to be pretty moderate. Um, uh, we have about uh, probably about three hikes being priced in for, 20, uh, for 2018 for the U.S. Fed. In Canada, the numbers are, are much better. I, I think we, uh, this has been uh, well documented. Uh, since about the second half of 2016, we've really seen the Canadian economy take off. Uh, part of that uh, move from the second quarter of 2016 through to the third quarter uh, was driven by a uh, rebound following the um, uh, what happened with the uh, the oil shot and the wildfires in Alberta, which uh, took off some of the production offline. But since then, we've had a very uh, sustained type of a growth trend here. Um, in the first quarter of this year, we had about 3.7 percent annualized growth, and we moved to second quarter four and a half percent. And comparing this with the U.S. Um, you know, it, it's been head and shoulders above its, uh, above its, uh, some of the uh, G7 nations that we often compare ourselves to. And what's been driving it? Well, a lot of it has been on the, uh, uh, the consumption side. Residential um, uh, con uh, sort of consumers have been providing a lot of support for the economy, making a lot of purchases, retail sales growth. Uh, we've also seen, up until more recently, uh, a big gain in, uh, or pretty strong gains in the residential and housing market. Um, the, the housing market has already turned lower, but that's largely because of policy issues. Um, the Ontario introduced its Ontario Fair Housing Plan in, in the spring, uh, and that really curtailed uh, sales uh, activity uh, immediately. Price of, prices declined, uh, and you also saw some, uh, some slowing of residential um, construction activity. Uh, other areas which have been uh, doing pretty well. Government has grown. Exports have uh, have also added to growth, although um, that has been a little bit more disappointing than what we'd hoped. Uh, looking at the labor market in Canada, the labor market uh, has geared off of uh, uh, these uh, uh, this economic activity. We've seen about uh, a real, really coinciding with that growth trend in Canada has been a rise in employment numbers, about 1.8 percent uh, employment growth. Uh, over this, uh, on a year-over-year -year basis, while the unemployment rate in Canada it sits about 6.2 percent. That, that is relatively low. I, I, we're not at full employment yet in Canada, but there's been a lot of slack that has been uh, taken out of the market, um, taken out of the economy uh, over the past um, past few quarters. So, where do we expect the Canadian economy to go from here? I, I, we're not going to. Um, maintain the, the growth pace that we saw in the second and third quarter that is not sustainable 
Uh, we have a, um, we're pegging the third quarter growth to be about 2%. If we look at the July and August numbers, it's really shown flatlining in the monthly uh, GDP numbers. And uh, so we're roughly tracking around that uh, one point. Right now we're about 1.8, but I expect to see a little bit of a boost um, in, the, in the latest month of the quarter. That should uh, you know, lead us to about that uh, around 2% rate for the quarter. And, and we expect that to be maintained going forward. On average 2017, we have a, uh, a growth rate of 3.2% for the full year and moving back in 2018 and 2019 closer to that 2% range. Uh, when we do look at the uh, some of the uh, constraints in the economy, I think that we definitely had a little bit of uplift in the export cycle. Uh, that has that has to be a concern right now because we have looked at uh, we've seen a number of months where the export cycle has been um, has weakened. Uh, part of it had to do with autos as a result of some retooling in Ontario, but we've also seen some uh, drop offs in uh, commodities and, and other types of of resources, uh, which has been uh, a little bit of a drag. Um, we would also expect to see going forward that the, the slowdown in the housing market will be will persist. Uh, the Ontario policy is still working through the economy, but also higher mortgage rates uh, and more restrictive federal mortgage rules um, in the new year are, are really going to be helping to uh, to uh, slow this economy uh, from that uh, first half 2017 pace. Um, one area that we should expect some boost or some offset is from the uh, uh, from the federal government. Um, they did announce some significant fiscal stimulus uh, in their budget. Uh, it does take time for that to uh, work its way through the economy. Well, we are seeing an increase in the government in, uh, investment in engineering numbers and growth. Um, we, we should start to see, at least in the lower mainland area, uh, possibly some gains from um, uh, transportation and, um, and um, things like maybe SkyTrain lines, our Regis corridor. Uh, those are our projects that may uh, uh, may benefit from the uh, from the federal government um, uh, packages. Not to mention, um, uh, they do have a plan for a national housing strategy. We don't really know what that's going to look like just yet for the federal space, but that could also provide uh, some further gains for the uh, non-residential investment sector. Um, one thing to note, though, is that inflationary pressure itself, when we look at the recent trends, still remain quite weak in Canada. Uh, there were about one point. We're, we're trending roughly about 1.6 percent, depending on the, the core inflation measure that uh, we're looking at. And typically, the Bank of Canada, of course, is looking for a target of 2 percent. Uh, so that does beg the question of why, given in inflation is so low, what's the purpose, and why have we uh, been uh, seeing uh, rate hikes over in recent uh, in recent uh, months and, and over the last quarter? Um, we have to note that the Bank of Canada is in fact forward-looking, but they're not—they're not necessarily looking at inflation today. What they're looking at is inflation tomorrow or in two years' time. Uh, and when we look at that as a as a measure, what we saw that with the strong growth in the first half and heading back in 2016, uh, a lot of the excess capacity has um, has dissipated in the economy. When we talk about excess capacity, uh, what we're saying is, uh, well, how much could the economy produce if we were to use all of our resources in in appropriate manner, labor, capital, land, anything like that, um, and versus where we were in fact operating. Um, the potential GDP itself is sort of a um, kind of a theoretical number. There's, there's no real great way to measure, but they do have estimates. And, and if we look at the past few years, for example, the blue and take, maybe take the average of both the blue and the red lines here, uh, which are below zero, it suggests that there was uh, quite a bit of excess capacity. Uh, but a lot of that has narrowed with that strong growth uh, phase that we've seen in the last couple of uh, uh, quarters. Uh, and the Bank of Canada uh, looked at these numbers and, and made a decision that it was time to remove some of that excess stimulus or what they call the insurance stimulus that they put in place uh, in 2015 following the oil crash. Oil has stabilized. There's no, less of a drag from that oil sector now than there was uh, following the aftermath. Um, and they did see it as a way to um, uh, to remove some of that excess stimulus in the economy. Um, so the question is, of course, where uh, where do we go from here in terms of the interest rate cycle? Um, and the fact is, the Bank of Canada has kind of it, it. They've been very. They haven't really given us a clear direction. Uh, they haven't focused on the idea of data dependence, uh, not so much forward guidance. They don't want to tell us where those rates are going to be, let's say, a year from now. And, and what they're looking at is reading through. Uh, the data itself, and, and part of this is warranted, I think. Um, <clears throat> monetary policy, in some respects, shouldn't be 
um, it, it shouldn't be completely certain of where we are or where we're going. Um, also, there's a lot of uncertainties in the market in general. I think that the, the Bank of Canada is looking at what are the potential impacts of um, NAFTA renegotiations. Um, they, they're watching the impact of the Canadian dollar. As, uh, if, they, if they announce a strong um, a rate hike um, uh, path, of course, the Canadian dollar is going to be is going to launch higher and, again, impede the, uh, the export, that export recovery um, narrative. Uh, the other component is going to be household debt levels. Household debt levels are high, and uh, they have expressed caution or um, uh, concern that uh, about how households will deal with higher interest rates. It's one of their uh, forward-looking um, assessments. Uh, and of course, new mortgage changes are something that's coming through into the and the slower housing market in general uh, is also going to be a drag. So where do we see it? Uh, well, we expect to see about three rate hikes uh, going through uh, 2018. We're looking at about a 1.75% um, end of year rate uh, for the Bank of Canada, uh, and of course, and another couple of rate hikes in 2019 as well. And I think that they will have to be, uh, again, they're going to be remain cautious. They're going to be, uh, they'd rather see a little bit extra growth, and they're willing to um, uh, to allow some more inflation. In fact, if we look at what the the Bank of Canada has, has been uh, pushing on and, uh, the, or um, focusing on in recent, uh, in recent months. They, they, they see the economy in a, in a pretty uh, sweet spot at the current time, where this higher growth rates or above potential growth rates in the economy may or may not, or may not actually drive much inflation growth uh, in the short term. Uh, so that says to us that they're going to be a little bit more patient in terms of their, their rate hike cycle. Um, the risk right now for the economy, as I mentioned, is that uh, we don't really know what's happening on the NAFTA front. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in the U.S. on the trade issues. Uh, you know, Trump has noted that they're willing to pull out of NAFTA. It's not that easy, however. Uh, they can announce that they're looking to pull out and, and give notice, but they don't have to do it um, in six months' time. And, um, and they're also there's going to be a lot of political pressure to stay in NAFTA, of course, with given supply chains are so integrated within Canada and the U.S. and there's a lot of organizations, companies that are uh, that are rely on NAFTA and uh, as a um, uh, as a way for uh, number one increase in demand or strong demand levels, but also uh, generally a more efficient uh, supply chain. <clears throat> so I don't expect necessarily to see I don't expect to see Canada, the U.S. pull out, um, but if in the event that they do, what would be the uh, implications? It's likely we would of course uh, move to a uh, WTO tariff structure, most favored nation status. That would increase, uh, that would mean uh, tariffs in Canada 4%, USA on average 3.5%. It, it depends on the good, uh, but that would raise prices, raise costs, and also um, uh, um, and lead to higher inflation. One other component of um, different uh, changes in trade structure, which could involve um, things like US content requirements, is that that could also lead some companies to leave, uh, auto companies to leave Canada. Uh, on the uh, on the international from overseas companies that they may find it cheaper uh, if, rather than changing the supply chain that they, they may find it cheaper to produce offshore and then ship it back into the US on a, on, a, on a tariff basis so there's a lot of uncertainties right now and I think that's something that the Bank of Canada will continue to um, to uh, be assessing uh, even if there is no pull out on that as long as there's policy uncertainty we'd expect that to have a negative impact on uh, the investment scenario in uh, in Canada, um, as companies uh, are not willing to invest as a result of the demand side um, uh, uncertainties. The Canadian dollars we're still looking at. Uh, it has it rose, of course, uh, following the uh, the rate hikes from the Bank of Canada and a, a lot of um, uh, expectations that they may be moving on to a more aggressive rate hike uh, cycle. It has since moved lower. Um, you know, we're looking, it's, it's always very difficult to do exchange rate forecasting because of the, not only uh, the U.S.-Canada um, uh, relationship, but also the fact that, uh, that given that you, it's also based in, in large part on a U.S. cross, um, across the tendencies of the other global trading partners. Uh, we're working with the assumption that we will see a rebound in the Canadian dollar. The oil prices have gone up, uh, and we're looking at about 81 to 83 cent dollar in our planning assumptions right now for uh, 2018 and 19. <clears throat> These are, this table really uh, essentially um, uh, provide, uh, summarizes some of the Canadian or Canadian outlook. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, if we look at British Columbia, I think that the numbers in BC have remained uh, very strong even into 2017. Where uh, the most um, the 2016 numbers that came out uh, uh, confirmed a very strong growth pace for Canada in uh, 2016. Um, and really, we're now entering what will be the fourth year in a row that we have growth above four above three percent. We're we're projecting about a 3.7 percent growth rate right now. Um, uh, and this is in line, if we go back to, uh, to some of the trends that we've seen, this is probably mid-2000s where we, the last time we saw uh, the sustained type of a growth pattern. If we compare this to the rest of um, Canada and other provinces, what you can see is that BC has done very well uh, in terms of the economy. We've averaged about 3.2% growth from 2014 and 16, which is uh, above all other provinces. Ontario was second, around 2.5%. Uh, Alberta was a, was a laggard of a 1% uh, negative, near 1% negative growth over the period, but that's largely driven by what happened in um, 2016, um, where they had a, a contraction of more than 3%. Uh, the, Canadian, the BC economy uh, really has been um, uh, gearing off of a, a lot of these uh, uh, larger macro trends. So the low Canadian dollar providing a, a good lift to both goods and services. Uh, export sectors. We've seen um, uh, not only our, our uh, exports of, of uh, commodities all rise, are, are rising, our um, manufacturing products are up, uh, but a big gains in areas like tourism uh, and also other professional services. Uh, we've seen consumer demand higher as a result of a, of a, of a virtuous cycle in the economy. Uh, interest rates uh, being low have helped the housing market. Uh, there is some uh, commodities have improved this year, but generally investment in the area has been somewhat unspectacular, but it's stabilizing with the higher prices right now. Um, and currently there are some risks to major projects due to uh, provincial policy uh, but and also other market dynamics. But overall, I think the, the BC economy has done exceptionally well. And if we visualize what's happening in the economy uh, and some of the key indicators, what we do see is that um, Labor markets are, are a very good indicator of um, what's happening. And this year, we've been tracking roughly anywhere from a 3.3.5 to 4% year-over-year growth rate uh, for employment numbers. Um, this compares to uh, the Canadian growth of roughly about 1.8% year-over-year, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and a lot of this, of course, has been in full-time. We're seeing a relatively strong split between part-time and full-time jobs. Meaning that you know the jobs that are being created are generally good jobs. Uh, they're um, uh, they're secure jobs. Uh, there is of course uh, always going to be some gig economy. There's going to be uh, involuntary uh, part-time uh, numbers, but the numbers we're seeing from the, on the involuntary part-time are actually quite low as well. So uh, this is really just a reflection of, of a strong economic base. Unemployment rate in BC has fallen below five percent, and the um, the participation rate um, so. Um, uh, the, are about 65%. Uh, participation rates rising uh, generally throughout the year, except for the latest uh, pullback, uh, has reflected uh, more optimism in the economy. People who may have been uh, looking for work or weren't working or maybe retired individuals uh, are finding uh, a good reason to come back into the labor market. And if they're looking for jobs, they typically are finding them, given that strong employment growth cycle and the low unemployment rate. Uh, and, if, and if we look at employment by growth by industry, the numbers have been exceptionally uh, strong um, across the board. It's a very much a, a broad-based uh, growth in the uh, in the BC economy. We're not, we're seeing growth in agriculture. You know, um, these are very volatile, but again, another strong year for agriculture and farm uh, uh, and farm workers. Uh, we're also seeing uh, solid gains in construction, of course, with a very strong housing market. Um, transformation warehousing has been doing well. Uh, finance insurance, real estate, or all these areas have been doing quite well. Adding in that is a combination of services. So the tourism, this is a reflection of part of the tourism cycle as well. And more locally, again, we're seeing these strong patterns, of course, uh, in the lower mainland. Uh, the Vancouver CMA numbers are uh, are on the rise. You see unemployment uh, below uh, below five percent in, in the Vancouver CMA. Abbott's per mission is also uh, picked up as well in terms of their overall employment growth this year. And when we compare the, uh, the markets in, in uh, the lower mainland um, relative to other metro areas, what we can see is that <clears throat> uh, Vancouver CMA really led the growth in, um, in BC employment last year. We had over 4.5% growth in employment. Um, 
um, you know, very broad strokes of, uh, of uh, employment growth by, by sector. Uh, that slowed a little bit, but still a very healthy 2%. And if we compare this, how sort of Vancouver and Abbott's Remission have done uh, compared to, you know, other uh, provinces, it, it's definitely over the last few years has outpaced uh, other regions. Uh, this year, you see in Calgary and Montreal are, are rebounding. In Calgary, it's just largely because of a very poor uh, 2016 performance, while Quebec has um, has actually been one of the growth leaders for Canada as well. Um, and if we look at some of the the key indicators and, and where this growth is, like I've already mentioned on a high level of some of the growth, international goods exports are up about 20% this year. Uh, largely, uh, there's, there's some commodity price effects here because higher forestry prices, higher um, coal pricing and natural gas pricing, but even if we were to strip out some of those values, some of those price effects, we're still looking around at five to seven percent uh, growth in ex international exports this year. Uh, tourist entries are up; um, they, you know, they slowed in terms of the the levels, and they're actually turning out down a little lower. But they're still really near uh, what we call near record, a uh, new record levels of uh, of uh, of uh, tourist international tourist entries, especially in the overseas markets. Seeing a lot of individuals uh, visiting China and Mexico this year over the last two years, uh, and while U.S. visits have uh, risen uh, to the highest level since about 2002, uh, a lot of this growth, of course, being driven by the low Canadian dollar and some growth in other in other countries in terms of demand. Um, but other sectors have also done well. The TV and film is operating near capacity, uh, based on anecdotal information. We're also seeing again the technology sector seemingly. Uh, being geared um, uh, on, a, on a strong pace as well. Some of the uh, recent examples, just, you know, adding um, Amazon being a um, uh, being coming in and adding another, I believe, a thousand jobs to their to their workforce here. It's really a reflection of these are service-oriented uh, exports, either through north uh, other parts of Canada or even to the U.S. in some cases. And we're also seeing uh, the uh, the technology hotbed and the and the number of um, uh, startups in the region. Uh, doing quite well, and those are all largely service-oriented exports uh, for the economy. Um, this is all translated in part with the, the increasing uh, labor market or strength in the employment numbers uh, and other sectors, also in, translating into stronger retail and consumer demand as well. Uh, we have retail sales right now um, up about 10% year over year, year, year to date. Um, so these are the highest or strongest numbers since 1994, and outpacing uh, the rest of uh, the rest of Canada. Um, a lot of this is motor vehicle sales, uh, so there has been a big increase in the number of large ticket items as well. Um, housing instruction this year has also been uh, quite healthy. Last year we had a 30% increase in housing starts uh, across the re across the province. Uh, we're not going to see that type of growth this year, um, but the levels themselves, the level of housing starts, are still going to be in that 40,000 range. Um, these, there's only the fourth time uh, since let's believe about 1990 that we are seeing. Uh, these um, uh, 40,000 unit pace uh, for the annual numbers. And a lot of this growth has come in the Kelowna area uh, and the island um, uh, as we are seeing population flows, interprovincial population flows go to these areas as well as interprovincial. So people coming from maybe the lower mainland and moving into um, a smaller market due to affordability pressure. Um, one area that hasn't been doing so well in BC has been the non-residential investment side of the economy, but again, a reflection of uh, possibly that commodity sector and also previous cycles. We're not seeing as many hotels being built, office buildings being built um, uh, relative to recent years. <clears throat> when we look at the population growth numbers, uh, they have been pretty healthy, I think. Um, we are seeing, uh, when we're adding in net natural, so births minus deaths, we're adding uh, for BC about 60,000 new people into the region a year. Um, what we've seen since about 2012 has been a real increase in net interprovincial migration. This is where uh, people who have uh, are being attracted by not only uh, lifestyle effects of you know retirements and demographics, but a large uh, largely due to the strong economic um, conditions in the province, where you see low unemployment rates driving uh, net uh, uh, Albertans to the region as well as Ontario. Uh, uh, economic uh, or workers uh, to the area. Uh, in areas like uh, Vancouver CMA, what, um, you know, we are benefiting from interprovincial migration, but a large driver of this area uh, continues to be the international inflows. Um, these are new residents, um, non-permanent residents in some cases as, uh, as well. Uh, that would be some of those are students, 
Uh, so we typically rely in this area for our population growth on um, the uh, international migration numbers. Uh, those have been a little bit weaker, but we expect that to actually be growing quite a bit in the next couple of years. The federal government has announced that uh, their targets, uh, that they're raising their targets for international immigration, I believe uh, close to 10% from um, where they were. Um, and typically those international immigrants go into areas uh, like the larger urban areas like um, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal. Um, and, and that's going to be a boost for the economy and an ongoing boost for the, the retail sector as well in the housing market. Uh, we're expecting the BC's economy to um, grow um, this year about 3.7% and move back to about a 2.6% uh, rate in about 2018. We don't see as much growth coming from, uh, I think, the housing market. We're, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but essentially uh, the housing market is expected to slow. It'll be, it'll be steady, um, but, uh, and we're also expecting to see some boost from, however, uh, government uh, spending activity. Consumer demand, which has been uh, trending roughly over 3% growth rate over recent years, that's going to slow as well. I think that um, population inflows uh, coming to the province, is gonna, we're going to see fewer people from uh, areas like Alberta because Alberta's economy is doing quite well. We'll just have um, uh, that net gain that we've seen in recent years will start to dissipate and, and start to cool some of these, uh, these parts of the economy. Um, in 2019, uh, we do expect to see a couple of major projects going forward, and that should help our capital investment uh, structure in, uh, in BC and provide some uh, further lift uh, in, the, uh, in the economy. Now we're going to skip through a couple of these slides, uh, but here in terms of the labor market outlook, we're looking at about uh, from over 3% uh, growth this year, we're about 3.5% growth this year in employment numbers. We're looking at moving back to about a 2% rate. Unemployment rates in BC will continue to fall. Uh, we expect it moving down to about four uh, to closer to the four percent range. Uh, this is due to demographics, but also the, the health and the economy. And what it does mean is that um, wage growth in uh, BC will start to pick up, I think, rapidly as we start hitting that four percent rate. Uh, labor income growth is going to be around that overall five percent uh, to six percent range over the uh, forecast period. A combination of the um, of higher employment numbers and or, mild, or moderate employment growth but also strengthening wage pressures in the economy. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I do expect to see interprovincial migration start to, uh, to ease off going into the remainder of the year or remainder of the decade. And international immigration uh, continue to pick up um, uh, due, to, um, uh, due to federal policy. Um, so for the BC economy as a whole, like I said, uh, we do expect to see a pretty solid economic uh, uh, outlook going forward for the next uh, couple of years. Um, this is really extending the, the, current, um, uh, the current path of uh, sort of our BC's um, uh, very strong growth profile, uh, really driven by the consumer demand. Uh, however, housing will be a little bit more of a drag going forward. Um, if we move on to the housing market, it's important to see, to look at what's happening in the lower mainland. Um, you know, over the last year, uh, last a year or so, we've kind of been through a couple of uh, a lot of fluctuations. Uh, if we start from late early 2016, uh, what we saw was a very high level, the record high levels of housing activity, uh, partly driven. Of course, there's always a question of you know how much foreign buying. I think there was largely because of the low Canadian dollar and some of the government statistics um, that came out. Um, but that kind of came off rapidly after that, and. and not all the, the foreign buyer tax didn't come in until the until the fall. Um, lower, I think when we saw the sales drop off, part of it was just due to rapid price increases in the single family market, um, and as well as affordability constraints and exhaustion in the market. Uh, some other policies that were implemented in terms of luxury home buying policies, uh, and of course, in um, when the foreign buyer tax came in during the fall, we saw another sharp drop off in the uh, overall sales um, sales conditions. But since then. Um, we have seen a, a rebound. If we look at the overall sales conditions right now, sales are essentially back to where they were in the mid-2000 level. And, and in, in any way we look at this, this is still a very robust housing market environment. And I think when we tie it back to uh, what we saw in the economy uh, and low interest rates, that, that's been the key driver. We've seen the employment growth driving uh, sales activity. We've seen the, um, the levels of interest rates providing an ongoing boost uh, in the last couple of years, especially since uh, the Bank of Canada cut rates in 2015. Um, and when we look at what has been selling, it's pretty clear that the foreign buyer tax 
impact and the affordability issues are still having an impact on the detached market and economy, which is tracking essentially near the 10-year average and hasn't really recovered since uh, the fall when it, and when it really hit the bottom. But if you look at the multifamily uh, component of the market, which is the, uh, the apartment and townhome sector, uh, what we're seeing is a very strong uh, activity. Uh, apartment sales have skyrocketed. There has been the, uh, I think when we look at what's driving this, there's a, lo there's a strong desirability for uh, housing activity. There's a lot of millennials who are trying to get into the market right now. Um, when we look at the uh, low home ownership rate or the declining home ownership rates from 2006 to 2016, it suggests that there's a, there's a pent up demand in the market. Um, there's also been a lot of indi uh, more individuals uh, over the, la over the last uh, 10 census years of uh, young adults, uh, those under 35, living at home. Uh, so I think that there's still this, this pent up amount of activity that's been kind of driving uh, housing market activity in the last year. Uh, adding to this has been the BC Home Partnership Plan, which provided a boost for uh, some, in, some, um, uh, some buyers. And you are seeing those ingredients essentially for that, that uh, uh, rise in uh, apartment and townhome sales. Um, at the same time, however, we're also seeing a very sharp drops in inventory over the last year. Uh, essentially, the lowest levels of inventory, the resale inventory listings, uh, since about 2005 in both the, the Greater Vancouver area and the Fraser Valley Real Estate Board region. Um, there's new listings have been pretty steady, but they haven't risen with uh, strong housing price increases and, uh, and high levels of demand. It suggests that people are really sitting uh, sitting on their homes. They're not really in any rush to move if they don't have to, especially if you're in a great area. Um, and as a result, adding to this has been, uh, so that's been a real, uh, uh, some pressures on prices from the uh, resale inventory market. Adding to that has been the uh, new home inventory. Uh, everything that's being sold in the market, pre-sales, uh, has already been absorbed. Um, so inventories in the Vancouver CMA levels are really lowest since about 2006. Average for admission, uh, similar story of, uh, of how low um, uh, complete and unoccupied units are in the market right now. So there's essentially nothing for buyers uh, who are looking. And, and that's pushing a lot of pressure on the housing prices. There's uh, plenty of buyers because of the, the economic environment, and they are um, um, leading to these ongoing uh, sales asset listings ratios, which are indicator for sort of demand and supply and uh, balances. Uh, that's continued to drive a seller's market condition and putting upward pressure on uh, certain segments in the market. Um, rental vacancy rates in, in Vancouver and across all the major markets are exceptionally low. There's, um, uh, I, I would say right now that overall housing demand in uh, the metro areas and urban areas remain exceptionally strong uh, and there's very little relief for buyers or, or renters in this market. And in fact, I would say that the um, rental vacancy rates suggest really a uh, supply side crisis for uh, rental availability. And we'll see what happens in terms of the uh, changes in the Airbnb regulations and whether, and whether that's going to loosen up the, uh, the rental supply. And another area that we could see um, some loosening in rental and also overall inventory is the fact that there are a lot of units currently under construction in the market. Um, over the past year um, or last couple of years, uh, Construction times have really been lengthened, uh, and a lot of these units should be coming on stream in 2018, which should at least put some uh, a little less pressure on uh, some of these uh, areas uh, and some of these uh, segments in the market. That being said, uh, apartment prices, if you look at benchmark pricing, are up about over 20% this year, year over year. Uh, townhome prices are up about um, uh, 15%, and the detached homes are, you know, they're up about 5%. Um, again, there, there's been a pretty slow um, but that is reflective of partly uh, very high prices and in, uh, in the detached environment as well. Uh, this one here is just really uh, what's happening in terms of the year-over-year -year growth for by region on the composite index. Um, uh, you know, where we've seen, you know, there are some areas which have had very low growth for one for one reason or another. But generally speaking, um, uh, all areas of, of Metro Vancouver have shown a very aggressive home price growth over the last year. Uh, and these are actually being weighed down. These are composites. So they're being weighed down a bit by the single family market. Uh, if we go forward, so where, we, where do we think the, the market is heading right now? I don't, we're not going to maintain this uh, strong price uh, growth uh, pace. So we expect to see uh, sales, the sales environment that we're currently operating start to slow, uh, especially into the new year. Uh, first of all, you're, you have 
um, mortgage rates which are remaining which are on the rise uh, that is going to constrain uh, or lead to affordability constraints through higher carrying costs for buyers but you're also going to see the impact of federal policy uh, federal policy is um, uh, federally regulated institutions are are going to be uh, faced with um, uh, stress testing even um, individuals with higher more than 20 percent down payment uh, and that's going to cut the uh, the, afford uh, the ability to borrow for uh, borrowers and, and I, uh, you know and that's going to be there'll be a question of whether or not a, a provincial regulators follow suit but uh, overall we are going to see a drag on the uh, the housing market from uh, tighter uh, credit availability uh, and that's going to help and, and that's a very I think that's at some level, uh, that's welcome given uh, slowing of the market is, is welcome given the, uh, the high levels of uh, activity we've seen over the past year. Uh, adding to that, in terms of the pricing side, I expect to see that you know we we're going to see that with the housing starts rising over the past year, especially in average remission and high levels of metropolitan in May. Um, that is, as I mentioned before, the uh, is a uh, should be a dampening factor for uh, the housing prices and, and availability of supply. Uh, my apologies here. These are not complete unoccupied units. These are the actual units under construction in the market right now. And as you can see, they are at record high levels. And if, as these things, as these units start to complete, you will see some of them as, uh, even though they're all pre-sold, uh, this should lead to some existing home inventory increases. You should also see uh, a number of uh, these units going to the rental pool, uh, which should help to uh, alleviate some pressures in the, in the, the vacancy, in vacancy rates. Uh, these are just a slide as to uh, look at what are some of the impacts of the OCB20 um, impacts of the tightening of uh, federal mortgage rules. It could be uh, significant. I expect to see you know, sales drop about 10% in the new year as a result of these. Uh, I don't, however, expect to see uh, much uh, movement in terms of, the, I think, the pricing side. I think the prices are going to remain uh, quite, um, uh, quite strong. I think the prices in the... Uh, uh, in the lower mainland and the apartment and townhomes will need to rise, although with a decelerated pace. Um, uh, demand is still, again, very strong as a result of the, the economy uh, and also um, rising, but still high, still low um, mortgage rates in the market. Um, that being said, again, we're going to see a little bit more of a of relief, I think, on that on that front. Um, so I, I think with that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions on our on our current outlook for the for the economy if there is any. So you can if you do have a question, you can just type the question into your uh dashboard for go to webinar and uh Brian can can tackle it. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Well, Brian, I want to uh, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, spend with us. I think the information was uh, uh, really enlightening for us, especially what's going on with the housing market and the effects of new government policies and what that's going to look like in the coming year. So really appreciate the time that you spent with us, and uh, we'll look forward to, to having you join us in the future again. Thank you very much, Michael. It was great to uh, be part of this uh, event. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Uh, just as a uh, just as a heads up, we will post the webinar on the website if you want to go back and uh, review it at a at a later point. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye bye.